Izzy Ruiz, who is the producer of BX3M, and Judith Escalona, who's the writer director. Congratulations, Judith. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us. No, lovely to, to meet you. Um, so, yeah, if one of you could perhaps just give us a brief synopsis about BX3M. You know, BX3M, really, uh, the title means Bronx. BX is the Bronx, and 3M mm -hmm. refers to Maria, Mona, and Michael, who are the three main characters of the uh, film. And it's a story of, it's a coming of, of age story about uh, three teenagers growing up in the Bronx, and um, each one ha faces their own particular issue. Like Maria's like very much in love with Michael, mm. and it's heartbreaking because he's not really right for her. Mm. And Mona has a uh, sexual identity issue. Uh, she doesn't know if she's straight or gay. Because she's got Sam in the sidelines who turns out to be the girl, is that right? Right, yeah. and that Sam, and, and then she also has Seneca, who's the boy who's in love with her. And she's like, like totally undecided and just caught in this like lover's triangle. And then there's Michael himself, and you sort of see uh, he's a kid who's suffered a trauma at a very young age and how he attempts to deal with it and why he's wrong for Maria yeah. as a consequence. But he sort of overcomes his circumstance in the end. And that's why it's yeah. absolutely critical to watch the film to right all the way to the end. Because it's, it's the last like five seconds that really reveals the entire narrative. Okay, and how did you get drawn? Perhaps I, I, I'll ask you this actually, Izzy. How were you drawn to, to make this? Because I've, 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 I've read some notes on, your, on the website concerning both of you, but how, what drove you to make this film? Uh, well, it was actually serendipitous. You know, um, it, about 10 years ago, I was actually a performer. I was only getting into production more in local television, and I actually answered an ad for a casting for this movie. And I walked into her office and I auditioned and I auditioned for Seneca, mm. uh, which I did not get. Which right. is actually better that I didn't. And I got a smaller role and we did the first table reading and um, I was really moved by her passion, even at that first meeting with all these actors. And you know, it was an exciting moment to see the caliber of talent she had pulled together. And I said, hey, you know, I'm shooting maybe three days out of this whole production, let me just offer just to be a part of the production. I, I was just starting as, you know, a young sort of producer myself, and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to join the team. And she really just saw an enthusiasm and said, hey, here's the notebook, and we shoot in two weeks, and let's go. And she uh, kind of gave me a, an opportunity to step it up, and eventually the more we continued to work together, she offered me the producer position, really. Yeah, because you've worked, I spoke the story, yeah. continuously since that moment, you've worked together, I guess. So you yes. are a team now, part of a team. Yes. And Right, again, getting back to the notes I've read about you, so your, your degree, we touched on this earlier, is in sociology. sociology. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. I'm guessing when you were at, at uni, this was never your first, no, not that there's anything wrong with being a film, because like, it's a fantastic <laughs> career, but how did you actually think, well, really, I'm doing my degree in this sociology, but this is what I really want, or did you kind of fall into it? You know, well, what I was studying was really about um, case studies of major media brands, you know, how they became media. I also studied... Um, how marginalized communities um, express themselves in the media, how Latino communities were becoming more visible uh, on TV and film. So I was already thinking, how do you express a community's experience, um, how that has grown over decades, and also in terms of how you make something uh, commercial and viable. So I think, um, and I was producing, I was producing events and I was producing you know, small uh, videos and, 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 and fashion events uh, at uni. So I was already sort of trying to figure out ways to do fun events and, and, and fun content uh, that was also trying to address uh, you know, a need for more voice in different communities. So it really was slowly like, sort of a, a passion or a curiosity or a hole in a voice that really sort of compelled me slowly and slowly and slowly to become a producer. And her project was addressing uh, so many, not only issues of uh, the LGBT community, the Latino community, the Bronx community, but the issues are evergreen and they're timeless. So uh, it, it, was, it just sparked me to, to join her uh, and become the producer because the story needed to be told. Very much the script spoke to me personally, my own personal life, uh, growing up in the Bronx, being LGBT, 
um, being a, a child of a single mother. Uh, so it really, I, I felt like I was reading a story about myself and not about myself. So I needed to make this movie. And uh, I, I, I just, you know. See, I, I, I didn't I, even know that about him. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, right now. I didn't know that he was so compelled by the narrative that Very I had Very passionate, written. which is great. Yeah. So, Completely. so it's really fascinating. I'd met his mother, and his mother was so key in really getting him into Harvard, and also um, connecting us really because she was the one that saw yeah. the ad where I was auditioning. It was an open call; anyone could come down to my gallery and and uh, and just like try out. And she was the one that connected us actually, and so. As far as his career evolving and developing and our relationship, it really grew out of his mom. And in the, the, in the Mona story, because it, the film Bronx 3M is divided into three parts, Maria's story, yeah. Mona's story, and then Michael's story. In Mona's story, it's a single parent. It's a mother and her daughter. And it's Mona. And it's how the mother relates to her daughter that makes the difference. And actually, in the, um, throughout the film, it's really the relationship between the teenager and the uh, parents that makes a difference. And so Maria has both her parents, Mona has her mother, and Michael only has his father, but his father works. And so he's really uh, a latchkey kid. He's really just growing up in the streets and alone, basically. And so the other two have guidance, some sort of guidance, however imperfect the parents may be, they're still involved in their, yeah. their, their child's lives. And, and so it's sort of, in that sense, was a reflection of actual life. Mm -hmm. And that's why it resonated for Izzy, I yeah. guess, to that, to that extent. And uh, so, it's, so it's sort of fascinating for me as the writer, and uh, because it's all in intuitive. It's all like, um, it's not something necessarily that you, know literally and carry with you. It's just intuitions about being human mm. and how uh, one relates to other people and what one observes and okay, maybe things that you've read and how all of that sort of comes together and shapes the reality of your film, which is a reflection of how we live or how we might want to live. And, and, and when you're, I know, you're obviously credited as a writer, but when you're sitting there putting this together, and then Izzy, are you involved going, I'm sure you bounce ideas off, off him, and you know, as, as a production company would. So how involved would you be in saying, yeah, okay, that, I'd really like that, but this, it, I think it should be done, I don't really want to be treading anyone's toes, I'm, I'm just assuming that's how you do things, I don't know. No, that's okay, that's, that's, that's a Does that really make sense? Yeah, that's a big do, do assumption. You, do you, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know if you were involved, what I'm trying to get you is know, who you involved she, in that process. She is a, a, a leader in terms of being a, a writer and, and a visionary, and uh, you really begin to trust where she's going. She really ha is very philosophical, and uh, she really talks you through where her, her point of view, and you know, it, it's actually allowed us to have, have great personal communications about you know, issues uh, just involving personal lives and, and, and bigger messages and issues uh, in communities. But you know, she is a tour de force. You know, mm. She is coming from a, a place that, you know, She's eloquent and more eloquent than many people are, and uh, she's soulful. And she's sort of this wise, uh, this wise storyteller, and you know she's also a director's director. So you know she she likes what she likes. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, but also we ha we have a great relationship because you know we'll sit in the editing booth and you know I'll look at something, I'll edit something, and she'll hear something and I'll hear something, and you know we have that moment to really put it out there. And I'll say no, really look at that, and she'll say, well, I don't see it that way, and you know. You know, she she gets what she wants, but she she's open to to, to talk about you know. Yeah, I'm open to suggestions. Very very of yeah. course of yeah. course, but you know she has a strong vision when she walks into a set, when she walks into an editing booth, um, and she because she's thinking about it every moment of the day. So I, I really trust her and her voice. So and I'm I'm open to the suggestions, and I'll I'll really consider them, and then I'll say. No. I, don't <laughs> 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 I, say not yet. No, no. I mean, I, I, but I do really seriously uh, consider, especially I Izzy's uh, opinions, and uh, and then I, I, it's just, it's more like again intuitive. Like I, I just really always keep in mind what the narrative is really about and what's the through line, and how this might really take us away from this suggestion may not really pursue that straight line. Mm -hmm. 
And did, did you storyboard? It, uh, we Not didn't really, really storyboard, no. Yeah. Because we were really looking at locations and, right. st and basically stealing them. What we call in the States, like stealing a location. Was it like guerrilla film? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really a guerrilla film. Right. Really. So, so it's just like we would have a location and look at it and really then place the action. And that was really critical because actually the, lo the location actually shapes the, the character of that scene and how we move the actor through that space. And so uh, we might have an idea. I mean, we definitely had a shot list and we needed certain close-ups or certain moments. Uh, but as far as actually storyboarding... Um, I suppose if you're doing it, that would be difficult really. to... Because if you want to shoot a certain location, yeah. you can't really envisage that. Yeah. yeah, you've got to work to what's available. Right, and so if we built sets, yeah, definitely, you know, which is a project I, I'd like to do that's totally artificial. Uh, something like a film that I really love is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and that's such, such a bizarre set. I'm not sure I've seen that. Oh, it's like really, it's like a... Um, a German expressionist film, right? And it's sort of bizarre, and it's black and white, and the the uh, characters characters look bizarre. They're like really pasty white uh, powder and. Well, it and sounds makeup. like a Nosferatu film. Or yes, something. it is like Nosferatu. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. No, I haven't seen. But that. it's not. It's like super brilliant because the whole film takes place in someone's mind, and he's insane. Right. Okay. And it's it's really brilliant. And in terms of production in the Bronx, there really was a, a lack of services to find expert location uh, scouts to know what we needed. Um, and I think we had to do it ourselves and, 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 f and have the, sort of the Bronx sort of paint the picture for us. And it, it was we sort of a... We didn't have any money for that. So that, 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 was, that was really, <laughs> you know... <laughs> that but was really either way, there really is, you know, there really is no one that sort of owns the landscape to say, hey, that's you know, true. you that's should true. come here, you should go there. So, you know, that's did true. it ourselves. At that time, I, I think um, most people were still shy of the Bronx because of it's, it's a... It just people have had a certain image of what the Bronx is like. Uh, well, here I just met some filmmakers, and the only image they could call up about the Bronx was Fort Apache, mm -hmm. the Bronx. Yeah, which that's kind of what was going through my head. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. made in the 70s, yeah. Yeah. so it's sort of bizarre because it's so completely different now, and and so a lot of the location scouts aren't really familiar with the Bronx. But actually, we wouldn't have afforded it anyway. And I also uh, I'm one of the directors who who's really hands on, so I'd like to go and see the space and see the location, not just look at a picture. Right. Although a picture could prompt me, you know, to, to have some interest in it. But it's it's really just uh, I'd, I'd go with my uh, with Izzy at times or, or with really with my cinematographer. And so you know, Ted, Ted Chichelsky. And so we just go around and go, mm, nah, or yeah, this really works, or you know, this type of stuff. So, um, but you could spend weeks, I guess, going around every street. Yeah, and, every and so we were, you know, like some shots, some some of the scenes were actually, I I just found by accident. It was just like a freak, uh, you know. So well, you're we, like, oh, hang on, well, this is it kind of thing you mean you were well, you literally driving down the street and not and then suddenly you saw something that's yes the yeah. like the scene when the scene when the limousines just g coasting and and uh, Michael's like carrying a bag of groceries and he's walking and he walks past like these like this furniture that's just thrown in the street like people toss furniture out in the street and it was a, a bed and like some sort of cabinet or something we just we were just like driving past and said, oh wait a minute, okay, this is where we're going to shoot the scene, yeah. and we're going to have Michael just walk through, because we wanted to have uh, a, actually a s sort of relating to that Fort Apache look, like something that was really run down. Yeah, it was quite grimy look, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, because we wanted to contrast the, that grimy look with the limo, and the uh, possibility of a new life for the, uh, the, the students who are graduating from college. And Michael isn't, he's outside, you know, so he really stays as a part of that inner city. And, and what do you think the, or an audience wants when, you're, when they're sitting down to watch a film? What, it, what, goes your, what goes to your head in terms of we think an audience would want this and how do you sort of stick to, to that? Does that make sense? Because I suppose at the end of the day you want someone to be entertained. I know it's your vision and your dream and you want to get it on screen, but 
I don't know if that sort of is, if, you're, if that makes sense. You know, I, I think this, the whole question of audience is really critical because I think when I, when I really set out to make this, I was really looking at the Latino audience. Yeah. And, and that's why there's, there's a, a, a part of the film that almost seems didactic but it's something that all the themes are universal and even the parts that are sort of uh, teachy are really things of like you know taking care of your family i mean everyone relates to that take care of your kids kid listen to your kids and try to relate to them hey we all have problems with that you know that's universal but i think uh, especially i was really um trying to project a different image of Latinos and how they're perceived in, in, in the States. And, and at the same time, even if you don't really uh, know that or part of that, that whole uh, dialectic, you would still relate to the film because it's about teens, the issues that teens confront, as well as the parents and what, you know, dealing with their teens and teens dealing with their parents. So everyone relates to all of that. Mm -hmm. So as far as the target audience, I'm not really as much interested in that. I've, um, I think I've like uh, absorbed, a l I love opera. And so I think the film itself, you know, has moments where it lifts you and then it drops you and it sort of takes you on this coaster ride until the end. And then you have the denouement. No, the denouement, I like <laughs> Which is like the gun blast. Mm -hmm. And then everything, you know, love. He has the, you know, Michael has the freedom to love now. He's not stuck in his past. He opens up. But of course, he might go to jail. But, 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 but on a profounder, on a deeper level, he's achieved a certain freedom because he's overcome the death of his mother. When he was three, he witnessed the killing of his mother. And it's something he always carried and that made him angry. And so even though he loved Maria, it couldn't really work. But by the end, when he avenges his, his friend's death, Pusshead's death, his past and his present fused together. So he was too small to do anything about his mother. But here he does something about his best friend who, who's killed by a drug dealer. And then he, he, he's free. Uh, and what about the casting? Because obviously the casting is critical. Tell me something about that. About how, well, the casting was great. The casting... Um, how many did you, people did you see? I should have asked, really. Oh my God, it was how quite it a while ago. It was a lot. I mean, there it's, was a cast of thousands. Yeah, yeah. first film. of all, there's that. Yeah, but I mean, it's going through, yeah, but the main character is going for the main one. Because you know, they're carrying the film, aren't they, ultimately? Yeah. Oh. Um, you have a better memory of that. We probably spent uh, uh, over a month, I would say, two months casting. I would yeah. say even um, more because we always we had issues with certain. Right, right. Characters. You know, we we you know we definitely w w were casting as you were producing, mm -hmm. as as it was building, and you know mm -hmm. when you're a no budget film, you kind of have to work in sections, and you know. Yeah, we had uh, a schedule, and we wanted to meet that because we already had two of our leads. And then uh, we were still unhappy with one of with one of our characters, uh, and the and well, so the we casting of that yeah character. the casting yeah right. the casting of that character, and so we const we're constantly looking, and then finally we re found the, a great solution to the whole predicament. But you have to see the film to <laughs> get that one. Is, is, um, it, is it oh, so we saw we saw hundreds of people. Yeah, yes. right. I mean I. I Forgive me for asking this because it's, as we said, it's no tricky questions, but is it a tiring process? I mean, because you've got to see all these people and. No, it's not, actually. It's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I, th th I think for me, uh, uh, we were casting Latino actors, which A, is a very small pool of people in New York at the time. Yeah. And at a certain level of skill, um, you want to get people that are authentic not only really theater a th theater actors, uh, you also want people that represented uh, various communities in the Latino culture. Mm. So we, want, we wanted to have a diverse cast, and it was, it, it was, we needed to see the most amount of people, to the most amount of color, the most amount of flavor, so that the acting was different, the, the tones were different, the mood was different, the looks were different. So it was fun in that respect, because you, we were seeing so many types of, you know, of, of that, Stereotype, if you want, if you would say. Yeah, you become familiar. It's like actually refamiliarizing oneself with our community mm -hmm. because a lot of us, 
you know, you have a certain background and then you sort of outgrow it and you leave. And so this was also a process of reconnecting. And so you're seeing actors and, and um, you're really s seeing their skill level, but you're also reconnecting with that diversity. I, I'm, my background, is I'm half Puerto Rican and half, half Filipino. And so my connection is really with the Puerto Rican community. I saw that connection on your website as well, because I was going to ask you about that, because you've touched on Latino, and I know this website, the PR... PR Dream. PR Dream. So I can see that you're really sort of plugged into all of it. Yeah, and that's like, a, that's like really one of the first Latino websites in, in the world, actually, including Latin America. It was one of the first. It was like, it's, either, it's the first of its kind. Ten years old, is it? Ten years? No, it's 16 years 16 old. 16 years old. It's okay. just like when the web was really uh, starting up. And so I have to revise it, but I want to archive that site, actually. But I'm very connected to that community because of, of my, my family. Mm. And so it's um, because of that, but the Puerto Rico, the Latino community in New York City is very diverse. There are now a large Dominican population. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, uh, people from Latin America and people from Central America. And so, and, and of course, Mexico too. There's a very large Mexican presence in New York now. And that's, and that's great because you see all this diversity. And so we were casting for that pan-Latino identity. <laughs> and, um, and we achieved that. And act, so we, we achieved that. So it was familiarizing ourselves on, on that level. And being a sociologist is perfect for <laughs> Izzy to be there. You know, and also, <laughs> you know, we wanted to capture, and Judith is very thoughtful with casting because you want to capture that New York City experience because you have generations in one city, in one household. So who's going to have the accent? Who's going to be better at Spanish? Who's going to have the American accent and not know how to pronounce certain words? Because yeah. that's what's happening to in the diaspora of, of these communities, you know, building their roots in America in major cities. You know, you have the, the language barriers even in a household. And, right, you right. know, one parent has an American accent, one has a thick accent, one kid doesn't speak, know Spanish where the mother does. And, you know, that has to be thought, really thought out too to really show people what it's like to be an urban Latino in America. Right. Because of course the pennies just dropped. Now you're talking about social social. Of course really, what we're talking about here is you're the expert in the study of people, really. I mean that's your... I that's mean really as, as an artist and a sociologist, yeah, exactly. you know, I, I, I don't know, know what they so taught them at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> but no, 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 I see because you know, I'm not sure how familiar they are with Latino. <laughs> well, I taught them maybe. <laughs> yeah, but all these different cultures and people in the mix, so that's what you've basically, I guess, is study. So I can see how this connection makes perfect sense because you would know Forgive me yeah, for saying and this. And okay, I, yeah, I that's the right accent, or maybe he's not quite right for the part because he's not quite got the quite the right look, or the way he's pronouncing this is not really hitting the hitting it, the nail. Yeah, it's really it's really actually uh, dictated by the script itself. Like mm. if you see the Maria's part, because her her mother is, it's a more traditional story. So you have her mother is from the island, and her father is what's called New Yorican. So he, he was Yorican, born, I yeah, like so he, you know, I'm New Yorican, he's I'm New, New Yorican, yeah. <laughs> so, our, our, we, so our, our Spanish isn't very good, and we're really basically uh, American, and, and even worse, like in New Yorkers, no, not worse, that wasn't <laughs> the that. correct <laughs> word, we're actually New Yorkers, yeah, yeah. which are a quite distinct group right. to the rest of the country, but, um, and so you see within that family, within that short little part of Maria, which is the, half, the first half hour, you really see like this kind of diversity that's built into the Puerto Rican community, of something that's generational. And then the, the shift, it's something that's transcultural. So you have like the mother's uh, from Puerto Rico and the father's from New York and the daughter's from New York, but she spends a lot of time in Puerto Rico, so she has an accent. Her mother, she speaks to her mother in Spanish, and then she speaks to her father in English. And then her father speaks to her in English, and he speaks to his wife in Spanish. And his Spanish has a little bit of an American accent, but that's okay, because they're still all communicating. Mm. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of, um, maybe, you know, people may miss that if they're not from, from uh, a certain part of the country, but I think people who, come who are immigrants relate to that perfectly you know they they really understand that and i've seen that over and over again you know just uh, people of other backgrounds say oh yeah that's the way my my son cannot speak hindi or my son cannot no longer speak italian you know i i really just have to uh, translate things for him 
And that's, that's, that's why this film has so much uh, great market potential because everyone knows an immigrant experience in another country, whether yeah. it's going to America or moving from India to, 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 to the UK or to France. Yeah. And, you we know, all, it, we it, all know. It, it, it's, you know, a, know. It, it, you can call it a Latino film, but really it's, it's, it's an immigrant experience. Uh, it's a teenage, a teenage experience. Uh, it just happens to be through our voice, which, is, which was, you know, curated to be a certain way to be authentic, but everyone's going to relate to what you see on the screen and, and those sort of, you, you may not understand the language, but you're like, oh, I, I see where there's a sort of a, a misstep in, in the way the mother's talking to the child. And, and that's why, you know, this is such a wonderful film to be showing here in Milan because your audience is as diverse, you know, and we have gotten great response as to people understanding and getting it. Um, and there are some fun conversations to be talked about, oh, I didn't understand that perspective, but you get the essence. You know, and that's really what you want the audience to have, to have that swell of recognition, um, which is what makes, you know, makes it commercial, which, and you know, the word is, you know, had this it's sort of double-edged sides to it, but, you know, it's a, it's a film that can be seen around the world, to be honest. Uh, you know, and, and just addressing this whole issue of culture and language is sort of fascinating because um, there's sections, there's a scene when, when Maria just learns things about Michael when she's sort of picked up by her best friend and they uh, go off and they're, uh, and they're down below, really down the below and their parents are still looking out the window and they've just exited the building and they're having uh, these cross conversations. The parents are speaking in Spanish and they're speaking in English and I sort of, it's like a Robert Altman thing. Yeah, I love so it. the, yeah, the yeah. audio is really complex and you're going like, what, you know, what am I listening to? Of course, we're, we're looking at subtitles. Some people are looking at subtitles, but which adds another layer to it. But it's basically, if you're bilingual in Spanish and English, you're kind of getting both at the same time. Maybe missing parts, but you're getting all the essentials. You don't really have to get every single word. And so that kind of complexity and confusion was, was sort of, I, I like that. Oh, I like, that I like when well. Altman does that. Yeah, I like that. It, in fact, it's funny enough, I was thinking of Jaws then, because um, there's a sequence, in a couple of sequences in Jaws, I know it's not Robert Altman, but when they're talking about how they're going to catch a shark and there's disparate groups of people talking about it and it's all confused and jumbled. Yeah, I like that. And I love that because you're like, oh yeah, and e even in Alien it happens, you know, there's dinner table and there's, I don't know, five or six characters talking about different things and it suddenly adds a layer to it, it seems more realistic. <laughs> yeah, and it's, yeah, it's closer to reality and that, that, that um, yeah, I mean, let's face it, the, the film is, is artificial, it's a medium. Yeah. And so you're really always going for the essentials. And so the, you can still get the essentials through, but you can introduce that complexity. So. You know what's funny about that particular scene, and her and I had this discussion when we were uh, doing the sound, I'm, I told her, can you bring down the voices of the girls outside? Because the film is, is, not, is non-linear. So if, if you're not paying attention, if you are paying attention, you sort of learn a little bit about the end of the movie at way in the beginning. Right. And I'm like, make the parents talk louder. I don't want them to spoil, you know, an hour and four minutes of what's to come. Right. But, that's, but that makes it what's fun about the movie. You have to really pay attention because you, you begin to connect the dots. You're like, oh, and you, and you see characters from, you know, the, the Maria portion that show up again in the end of the Mona, and it's like, wait a second, that should have been so-and-so. Yeah. And it's, right. it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of a puzzle. It's a sort of a, a, a mystery uh, sort of theater. And, right. and that's what makes it a fun thing to watch. Like the, the, the um, actually that section, which is sort of confusing, is really critical to grasping the fact that the Mona interlude, which is really massive and extensive in between the Maria and Michael story, when we reach Michael's narrative, it really shows you where he went, why he didn't show up to go to pick up Maria. Mm. And you, you already have a, an idea of that because of what, Mar what Mona shares with, with, Mar uh, with her friend, Maria, and tells her, oh, Michael's in the hospital. You know, and you know, she just like reveals like certain things to her. So, but well, how did he get there? Why is he in the hospital? Like, Pusshead's dead. Okay, I'm giving like certain key things away, but it's really critical. So you get the idea that Pusshead is dead. He, Michael has been screwing Liz and getting high, and that shatters Maria's life. She's like, you know, really in love with this guy, 
and she's a kid you know she's sort of innocent really innocent even for like teens today she's a very you know we have a stereotype of teenagers today it says oh yeah they're already like really know too much because of the films they've seen and a lot of the music videos but actually I, I you know I teach also and I've seen kids like oh, that are still virginal yeah, yeah. and let's face it they, those kids exist and so, you know, Maria's like that, and she's like totally devastated by this. But with that information, after you go through the whole Mona interlude, you come to Michael and you go, oh, this is where he went. And this is what he did. And that's what happened to him. And so these two stories sort of arc right over Mona. And then you see how Mo Michael resolves his issue. You see how Maria resolves her issues to break with him, but you see what Michael does to resolve his issue. And then Mona never really resolves her issue, and maybe it's not really mm -hmm. an issue to be resolved. Guys and girls, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. See, I told you, I knew hey, it. Steve. I knew it. Steve. 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 Knew it. <laughs> Thank the you. Whole Sometimes, when you love somebody, you can overlook a lot of things that you normally wouldn't. Don't. Hey, Mona, Sam here. Just returning your call. If you want to go to the drag show, let me know. I'll leave a ticket for you. You know the address. Hope you can make it. You've got to see these dykes. Hey, what's going on? Hey, hey, hey. Stop! Oh, I can't be my girl. My woman. I can't. What's up, Michael? Your mouth, Mona. Tell him my woman my bitch. Don't talk to Mona like that. No, shut up. You mean this shit? No, not this shit. This shit. <laughs>